that's done. I okay, just wanted to um, remind us about a couple of things before we uh, pray. Um, First Peter chapter one and verse thirteen. You know, it's, um, there's a instruction and a warning, uh, an encouragement. It says, "Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of." Jesus Christ, and um, says, uh, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to your former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And, um, uh, you know, it says, uh, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Okay, And then if you go down further, um, in verse 22, um, we see, um, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Okay, uh, Again, something to do with the soul, uh, our mind, will, emotions, intellect. So Paul is, uh, I'm sorry, Peter is um, encouraging us to gird up the loins of our mind, you know, be disciplined in our thinking, uh, be sober. And uh, and then here it says there is a purifying of the soul. There is a purifying. There's a cleansing that happens every time we obey the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren. So that's something that happens to our, you know, to our soul, uh, to our mind, will, and emotion. So um, just want to encourage us uh, and also, you know, uh, exhort us through this scripture to say that um, you know uh, let our minds not be passive, right? Let our minds be active, alert, uh, sharp. And yes, there are times when we when we are tired, when we are discouraged. But uh, you know, uh, always we can we can be uh, stirred up in our spirit when we pray in other tongues, when we when we read through the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God, and be quickened by His Spirit, and uh, and let our thinking, let our mind, our thoughts um, not be passive. Right? To to be passive is to go back and to conform ourselves. Uh, to the former things, right? It lead us to that, but to be active um, as our spirit is uh, active, uh, to be active and sharp in our uh, thinking as well, right? Okay, just wanted to share that. So let's uh, let's pray along those lines and um, let's ask the Lord to um, to you know, to renew us, renew our thinking, and maybe uh, you yourself are feeling that hey, I've been my mind has been really clouded with things. I've been you know, uh, uh, weighed down with cares, maybe, uh, maybe with other things, worries or fear, whatever. Um, but you can make a choice. You know, we can make a choice and say, um, no, I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to rein in. You know, I'm going to be sober-minded, and I'm going to rest my hope fully upon the grace that is to be revealed. Um, I'm not going to let my wander into other things, but uh, I'm going to be disciplined in my thinking. All right, let's uh, let's pray. Father, we we thank you for this, uh, Lord, encouragement from your word, O oh God, and we thank you for the exhortation to um, to to be sober-minded, O oh God, to rest our hope fully upon the grace that is to be revealed at the revelation of Christ. And uh, yes, Lord, we thank you that uh, even as we obey the truth, Lord, in the small things, in the in the big things, O oh God, when we obey the truth, there is a purifying, O oh God, a clarifying of thoughts and intents and will and imagination that happens, God, that there's a, uh, there's a strengthening that happens in our minds even as we obey. And so, God, we pray that, uh, Lord, that we will do that. And uh, I pray that our minds be sharp, that our minds be, that our imaginations uh, be pure and clear. And Lord, I pray that you will uh, clear, uh, bring clarity to our thoughts, Lord, uh, even as we uh, rest our hope on you, Father God. Yes, Master, we, I just pray for those uh, who are uh, experiencing some kind of heaviness uh, or some kind of, um, um, some kind of, yeah, uh, uh, fogginess or uh, unclear uh, thoughts and some fuzziness in the mind. I just pray, Lord, I pray for clarity. I pray that uh, that you will dispel, Lord, all that um, lack of clarity and, and bring clarity and decisiveness, oh God, in thinking and, and also um, that will result in clear actions as well, Lord. And so, God, we, we just want to thank you. We pray, we pray this uh, over each one present here. We pray this in, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right. Okay, so today's class, we uh, we are looking at, uh, like we did in the last session, uh, we looked at um, 
a uh, couple of evangelists. We looked at uh, uh, the life and ministry of um, um, Billy Graham, and we also looked at uh, the life and ministry of Todd White. You know, two very uh, different uh, people in temperament, uh, but uh, the common thing being the Lord Jesus and the love of the Lord, the love for for His Word, and the love for um, and the passion for bringing the truth um, to the people, to the masses. Right. So um, that is a that is the only thing common in uh, in both their lives, and uh, a very two very different testimonies, two very different um, you know life experience and background. Um, uh, we we see that. Yeah, today, um, just thought. Um, right, Avni. Thank you. I see that. Yeah. Um, um, so today, we, uh, I thought we'd look at, uh, uh, I just picked one teacher uh, of the word, and uh, and, uh, and we just look at his life and ministry and uh, probably uh, look at his uh, yeah, testimony as well. Um, and also watch, uh, uh, like like the last class, we'll watch a couple of videos, uh, one about his life and his, uh, about his testimony, and one uh, probably um, the uh, message. Uh, and you'd see very dis different, distinct styles, um, uh, very different from the evangelist, because uh, and very easy to make out. Um, definitely not a preacher, but uh, 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 definitely a teacher anointed to teach. So um, there's a there's a thoroughness in uh, and a clarity and uh, and a very steady laying down of you know scripture and um, uh, line by line precept upon precept kind of a teaching. So you know we see that. Okay, so uh, I I picked uh, Derek Prince uh, for um, uh, to to study to look at the life of ministry of the teacher and uh, uh, very early on, you know, uh, uh, in fact, I think maybe a month after I got saved, um, I I happened to listen to one of his messages. Somebody shared a tape of his. Uh, it was about uh, you know about spiritual warfare, and uh, I experienced a kind of a you know a deliverance um, that night, you know, or maybe that uh, that morning the night and morning and uh, you know it, it was all also a physical um, manifestation you know i was just kind of throwing up uh, a lot of times and uh, because no, there's nothing that i'd eaten but um, you know uh, i checked up i looked back but it was um, you know some kind of a manifestation uh, i experienced that as well um, so um, i have not listened to all of his messages i must uh, uh, you know, again, I make a disclaimer here. I've not listened to all of his messages, but I've listened to some messages of his on um, uh, demons and spiritual warfare and uh, spiritual authority, the believer's authority, and uh, you know, going from curse to blessing and so on. So some of it I, I have heard. Uh, so we will, you know, we we'll look at one of his messages also today. Okay, so um, so Derek Prince, it is. Uh, let's. Uh, I just share uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Um, okay. The thing is, what happens is when I make it, um, you know, when I present it, I'm not able to see uh, your screen uh, or the class screen. So I may not be able to see what you put on the chat. Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, so after this uh, presentation, I can look at the questions or even if you you know put something on the chat, I can take a look at that. Okay. So, um, so this is Derek Prince. Uh, uh, you know, this is what uh, some of one, one thing, uh, a quote of his said, Jesus is the watershed of human souls. Their destiny in eternity is determined by which side of Jesus they are on. And uh, yeah, so Derek Prince, uh, born into a British uh, military family. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that he was born, born right here in Bangalore, India, 1915. Uh, his uh, uh, his father was serving uh, in the uh, in the uh, British Army, and and that's how he came to be here. He was born here. Uh, for his studies, he went to Eton. Uh, was where he studied uh, Greek and Latin. Then to Cambridge. Uh, we had a we did a fellowship in ancient and modern philosophy at King's College, and also he's he uh, you know quite proficient in several languages. Um, he studied several languages, including Hebrew and Arabic. Um, and uh, he he uh, he was in Jerusalem. He spent a lot of time uh, there. He lived there. Uh, he got married there. And uh, uh, he, in the Hebrew University there also, you know, he, he studied Greek and uh, sorry Hebrew and the Aramaic. 
um but this is what he had to say you know before he came to know, know the lord and looking back uh, says i knew a lot of long words and phrases you know he was a philosopher you know had this um, hunger for wisdom and uh, um they read quite voraciously um so this is what he says uh, i knew a lot of long words and phrases and had tried a lot of different things but looking back i would have to admit i was confused frustrated disappointed dissolution i did not know where to find the answer okay so in 1940 he was enlisted in the army uh, as a in the medical corps as a non combatant soldier and uh, he did it based on you know his convictions he his family actually uh, uh, all the men served in the, as army officers and so on but he uh, did it as a non combatant soldier so um, you know one interesting thing is that he had read a lot of books he had a big library but uh, he he said why not take the bible and uh, you know there's uh, so it's supposed to be a philosophical work and uh, he he had not read enough of it um he had not he, he knew very little about it so he said okay let me take it and read it uh, you know so that's how he started reading the bible um uh, I, I must say that um, you know when he was in college uh, though he was from a anglican background um uh, with regard to his uh, beliefs his family's beliefs at least um uh, but he became more like an atheist uh, in his worldview, um, discarding all Christian roots and uh, you know anything of that sort. Okay, so he was uh, stationed at a training barrack uh, in Scarborough, Yorkshire, and 1941. Uh, this is this was his testimony. He says, "I heard the voice of Jesus speaking very very clearly through the scriptures, the Bible, and from that." Uh, from the day I heard his voice to this day, there are two things I've never doubted. I've never doubted that Jesus is alive, and I've never doubted that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, so a very uh, close association with the Word of God at all times, and right from the beginning. Right? Um, in 1944, while stationed here in Israel, uh, I mean, in Kiryat Mozin in Israel, uh, he again, uh, the Lord spoke to him directed him and said you are called to be a teacher of the scriptures in truth and faith and love which are in christ jesus for many so he uh, okay he preferred to teach from the king james um well uh, he he actually wrote uh, about i think 100 or so books uh, a lot of uh, programs uh, uh, radio programs and broadcasts, um, and also uh, a worldwide ministry traveled extensively and uh, taught in many uh, nations uh, as well. Okay, so he preferred the King James and studied the original Hebrew and Greek. Now, I just wanted to share this because uh, he, since he was a teacher of the word, thought it'd be interesting to see what Bible he read. So uh, this is what um, he did. Yeah, but also he used uh, modern translations like the NASB and IV. In KJVN, the Amplified Bible. Some of his quotes uh, it says, "If there is one thing that is hard for God to accept, it's half-hearted praise." Um, our basic problems as human beings is that we do not realize how valuable we are. Do not sell yourself short because God holds you in very high regard. He invested the blood of Jesus in you. Um, he died in 2003. Um, this is what his tombstone reads. Um, I think this is in uh, Israel again. He was buried there. It says, a teacher of the scriptures in truth and faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus for many, God is faithful. So uh, the very thing that uh, the Lord Jesus actually um, spoke to him and directed him uh, about his ministry is what is there on his uh, tombstone okay um so now what uh, i just thought we'll we'll watch a video and uh, it is uh, an interview with him so he shares about his testimony he shares about how he came to the lord and uh, how he started uh, on his ministry so let's uh, let's watch that
when World War II broke out, I was aged about 24. I was 24 when I was elected into a fellowship in King's. Oops, sorry, sorry. Um, and uh, about the same time, I was called up, taking the stand of a country. Sorry, just a minute. and subject her. I agreed to do non-combatant service. All that was a tremendous emotional crisis for me because every member of my army, of my family that I've ever known has been an officer in the British Army. So I was definitely departing from tradition. I mean, it was a departure from tradition when I became a philosopher, but worse still when I became a conscientious objector. But worse was still ahead for, me, for my family. They didn't know it because when I was drafted or called up into the army, my one big question was, what will I take with me to read? Because up to that time, I'd have one of the largest libraries in the world at my back door. And uh, I said to myself, here I am, a philosopher. I'm supposed to be an expert. But there's one book of philosophy in the world that I know very little about. And it's the most widely read and most influential book in the history of the human language. And of course, I was referring to the Bible, which I considered to be a work of philosophy. So I knew I would have very little room to carry things in the army. So I decided I'd invest in a Bible and take that with me. So I bought myself a nice new black Bible. And uh, my first night in the army in Boyce Barracks, Crookham, Hampshire, uh, there were 24 other new recruits. and. Uh, I thought, well, where do you start to read the Bible? And I said, you know, any, like any other book, you start at the beginning. So my first night in the army, sat down on the bed, pulled out my Bible, and started reading Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Well, I had no anticipation of the impact that it would make when somebody was seen reading the Bible in the army. And a sort of uneasy hush fell on the whole barrack room. Uh, but I was, I was baffled everybody, including myself, because when I wasn't reading the Bible, I didn't live the least bit like somebody who reads the Bible every day. I won't go into all the details. So, <clears throat> but I'm a determined person, so I said, I'm not going, this book is not going to beat me. I'm going to go to the end of it, and when I've read it all, I'll be in a position to give an authoritative, you know, evaluation of it. Well, I plowed along for nine months. And I got somewhere in the book of Job when I got invited to a Pentecostal church. Now, I had never heard of Pentecostal people. As a matter of fact, I, people, I don't think I'd ever heard of Baptists, to say the truth. I knew there were some people called Methodists who'd made trouble early on in British history. And, of course, I was a member of the church, the Anglican church, the Church of England, as they used to call it. But anyhow... This, this soldier came to me and he said, I'd like you to come with me to a place I've found Sunday afternoon. And because it was Sunday afternoon and it was rather, he was rather apologetic, I concluded it was a church. So I said to him, well, I, I want to tell you I don't believe in religion, but I've got nothing to do on Sunday afternoon, so I'll be happy to come. So we went to this Pentecostal church, and I mean, I have, you have to know, I'd never even heard of Pentecostals. And it was different. There's no denying that. They sang from red hymn books and they clapped their hands. And when they came to a chorus, they repeated it. I mean, it was a, it was a culture shock for me. Anyhow, I made up my mind. But what I really wanted to know was, did the preacher know what he was talking about? And I, mean, I had been trained to analyze and criticize for years. So the preacher actually had been a taxi driver before he became a preacher. Um, he took his text from Isaiah chapter 6. The year the king Isaiah died, I had a vision of the Lord, saw him in his glory, Isaiah said. And he said, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And when I heard that phrase, I said to myself, No one ever described you more accurately than that. A man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips, because no group of men in the world excel the British Army for uncleanness of speech. So after that he had my attention. I thought, you know, he must know something I don't know. And he was one of these preachers who didn't stick with any particular theme or period of time. And he was going up and down the Bible and I was getting a little 
dizzy following him, but he got to a stage where he was talking about the shepherd boy David and King Saul and, the, and the, some sort of interview between them. And he emphasized the fact that King Saul was head and shoulders taller than the rest of the people. So he did this rather vivid dialogue between the two imaginary persons. And when he was speaking in the, category, in the, in the person of Saul, he jumped up on a little bench and looked down at where he'd been when he was speaking as David. And I was following all this intently. But while he was on the bench speaking as Saul, the bench collapsed. He fell to the floor with a loud thud. And I mean, if you'd been planning something to impress a Cambridge philosopher, you would have left that part out. But as a matter of fact, I said to myself, no matter how strange this all is, he's got something I don't have. So then they came to quote the appeal. And you'll have to know, I've never been in a church where people made appeals or asked you to do anything so embarrassing as to put your hand up in public. And I couldn't understand what they were appealing about, but it got something to do with what had been happening to the man. So uh, I sat there in this stony silence. There was no background music in those days. And uh, two voices were speaking, inaudible voices, one in each ear. And one voice said, if you put your hand up in front of all these old ladies, you look very silly. The other voice in the opposite ear said at the same time, if this is something good, why shouldn't you have it? And I was absolutely paralyzed. I could not decide which voice to respond to. And then a miracle took place, a real, literal, physical miracle. I saw my own right arm go right up in the air and I knew I had not raised it. Somebody had raised my arm. And I tell you, talk about it being emotional. I was frightened. I thought, where have I, what have I got into? Well, that was all they were waiting for, this one soldier in uniform to raise his arm. <coughs> After that, they went ahead with the rest of the meeting. Nobody came up to counsel me or inquire about why I did it. But there was an elderly couple in the congregation who kept a boarding house. And they took pity on these two soldiers and invited us home for supper. <coughs> well, the army didn't feed us very well, so supper sounded very tempting. As we walked to their home from the church, this little lady of about 60 began to tell me some of her experiences. And she said that her husband in World War I had been exempted from military service because he had tuberculosis of one lung. Well, I knew enough to know that if he got exemption on that basis, it was a valid medical diagnosis. Then she said to me, I prayed every day for 10 years for, my, for, for God to heal my husband. And that staggered me. I couldn't imagine anybody praying every day for 10 years for anything. Then she said, after 10 years, I was in the parlor if you know Britain, you know what the parlor is. Praying by myself, my husband was sitting up in bed, coughing up blood. And as I was praying, an audible voice spoke to me and said, claim it. And she said, I answered out, Lord, I claim it now. And at the, that moment, her husband was instantly and completely healed in the bedroom. So I said to myself when I heard this, well, maybe this is what I've been looking for all my life. Well, we went there and we had a very good meal. <clears throat> they prayed at the beginning. When I said to myself, this is part of the whole package deal, goes with the rest. <coughs> there were about seven people around the table. The end of the meal, without any preliminaries, they started to pray again. And they were praying one by one around the table. And I looked and I saw my turn was coming quickly. And I had never prayed out loud in public. I had no idea what to say. When my turn came, I opened my mouth and I said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And my mouth shut like a trap. I couldn't say another word. And that's probably the best prayer I've ever prayed. Well, in this strange jargon that they used, somebody mentioned at the supper table, there's going to be a revival in the Assemblies of God on Tuesday. Well, I didn't know what a revival was, and I never heard of the Assemblies of God. But I said to myself, if it's the same thing, I'd better be there. 
So I was there. Same sort of people, different building, different preacher. <clears throat> and he took his text from the statement in Genesis, Enoch was not, because the Lord took him. And he was one of these preachers who believed in making things very vivid and up to date. So he described how the CID, if you know, the, the, the police, just came out with their tracking dogs to trace Enoch had disappeared and they followed the, followed the scent to a certain point and then it ceased so they concluded he must have gone up and I thought well that's logical you know my logic was my field of study well when he got to the end I knew what to expect every head bowed every eye closed and if you want this put your hand up so I thought to myself well somebody else put my hand up for me last time but I couldn't expect that to happen twice so I put my hand up and uh, afterwards the preacher came to me and I think he realized he had a problem on his hand. He'd asked me two questions. He said, do you believe that you're a sinner? Well, my specialty was definitions. So I quickly ran through some possible definitions of a sinner. And all of them described me exactly. So I said, yes, I believe I'm a sinner. Well, then he said, do you believe Christ died for your sins? I thought it over carefully. And I said, to tell you the truth, I can't see what the death of Jesus Christ 19 centuries ago could have to do with the sins I've committed in my lifetime. And I think it was wise he didn't argue with me. <coughs> I'm sure he and others prayed for me. Well, after that, I felt like a person suspended to, between two worlds. I'd stepped out of my familiar world, but I hadn't stepped into any other world. I was suspended. And the sort of inner pressure increased. Came about Thursday or Friday of that week, and I don't remember which. I made up my mind, I'm going to pray until something happens. I had no idea what I expected to happen. Well, we were billeted in a hotel on North Bay in Scarborough in Yorkshire. And uh, I shared a room with one other soldier who was a friend of mine. We had no furniture, just two straw mattresses on the floor. But we had picked up a little folding backless canvas stool, you know, the way soldiers pick things up if they see them. <coughs> so I waited till my friend had gone to sleep, planted this stool in front of the window, sat on it, put my elbows on the windowsill, and said, now I'm going to pray. And then I ran and I couldn't pray. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know whom I was praying to. I was just lost. And I, I sat there for maybe an hour. It was getting quite late, struggling with this attempt to pray. And then without any process of reasoning, I somehow became aware of a presence. I didn't see anybody with my eyes. And I found myself, incidentally, I had read the passage because I'd read that far in the Bible, <coughs> where a man met Jacob at a certain point in his life and wrestled against him all night. And Jacob in the morning said, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And without having that consciously in my mind, I began to say to this invisible person, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And I was saying it with great determination. And when I got to the phrase, I will not let you go, I couldn't stop saying, I will not let you go, I will not let you go. And at that point, something moved in and began to take control of me that I couldn't understand and did, or didn't recognize. And my arms went up in the air. Well, I mean, you know, an Anglican never puts his arms up in the air. And that was bad enough. But then I found myself slowly going further and further backwards on this backless stool. And I thought to myself, if I go any further, I'll fall off the stool. <laughs> And then I said to myself, I've got into this thing now. If I stop now, I may never get this far again. So I let go and I went backwards off the stool. It wasn't that I fell off. It was like I was deposited on my back on the floor with my arms still in the air. 
still saying, I will not let you go. And then, my, I didn't choose what I was saying, but this, speaking to this same person, I began to say more and more. And when I got to more and more, I couldn't stop saying more and more and more and more. And my arms were up in the air. I was on my back on the floor in the middle of the night in my underwear. And I was, at that point, I had, I was no longer in control. And after a while, I began to sob. Deep sobs that shook my whole body. But I had no idea what I was crying for. It was just like something had moved in and taken control. Well then after about maybe 20 minutes, the sobs changed to laughter. And at first I began to laugh very softly. But the more I laughed, the louder it got. And I mean, after a while, the laughter was reverberating around the room. And then I was in my underwear and my back on the floor with my arms up in the air about midnight, laughing. And I thought, what will happen if anybody comes in? Well, the only person who woke up was the other soldier. And I could see him over the top of my head. And he slowly and reluctantly uncoiled from his mattress and walked towards me, keeping a safe distance. And he said, I don't know what to do with you. I suppose it's no good throwing water over you. And something inside me said even water wouldn't put this out. But having a background in the Anglican Church helped me because I remembered that somewhere in some lesson I had read that men must not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And without any process of reasoning, quite contrary to all reasoning, I knew that what was in me was the Holy Spirit. So I thought I mustn't make things difficult for him. So with great difficulty I got on my hands and knees, <coughs> crawled to my mattress, got into it, pulled the blanket over my head, and went to sleep, but still laughing softly. Next morning I thought to myself, what, what happened? Was that a dream? Was it real? The army didn't give me any time to ponder that. But the extraordinary thing was the night before I hadn't known how to pray. The next day I couldn't stop praying. <coughs> Even if I got a mug of water, I had to pause and thank God for the water before I could drink it. And I discovered I was really, I mean, contrary to all my natural reasoning, I was a different person. I had been a habitual blasphemer, but no words ever came out of my mouth from that moment onwards. And prayer was now as natural as breathing. So the evening came and I usually went to the local pub to get a drink. I have no scruples about drinking alcohol, so I made my way to the pub, intending to go in and get my usual drink. But something strange happened. When I got to the door of the pub, my feet locked, and they would not go through the door. So I had the strange experience of standing in the doorway and arguing with my feet. And then I realized I'm not the least bit interested in what's going on inside that place. I don't want to go there. So I thought I'll go back and go on reading my Bible. I went back, and I was looking for the place in Job, which I'd got to, but I somehow I opened in the book of Psalms, uh, one of the, what they call the Songs of Ascent, and it said, when the Lord turned back the captivity of Zion, our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. I said to myself, that's what happened to me. I wasn't laughing. My mouth was filled with laughter. So I then came into a relationship with the Bible, which I've had ever since. That God speaks to me through it. It's a living word. It's not just theology or history. It's God, the Father, speaking to his child. And that was really a total turning point in my entire life. Okay, so that was um, 
that was about his uh, testimony, about his life. Um, so you see, um, you know, certain things that I uh, I couldn't help notice was, uh, uh, of course, he was a man of great learning, and uh, but you know, so far moved away from the Lord, and a very powerful you know transformation, uh, uh, and uh, the association with the Word, you know, the power of the Word, Word of God. And um, uh, uh, another thing that I noticed was the kind of seed that was, you know, um, put in his life. You know, he remembered some of his, uh, some of the things that had happened, or some of the things that he had read, or what he heard uh, in the church. Uh, and uh, you know, he made that his prayer as well. And uh, some of the contents of what he had read, he made that his prayer, uh, even when he didn't know how to pray. And uh, you know, a powerful. Uh, uh, a testimony, right? Um, so uh, we will look at um, what we'll do now is look at some of his ministry. So he went on to uh, serve in different places and uh, quite a you know uh, quite a powerful uh, uh, ministry of teaching and uh, teaching which um, you know which was also uh, accompanied with, um, uh, with with the supernatural. You know, like uh, I think it was in Kenya. Um, where uh, they prayed and uh, there was a res resurrection from the dead. Um, uh, you know, that's. Uh, I'll also share the link of his, uh, you know, website and ministry. You could check that out. So something like that also. So um, yeah. So it was not just the, the teaching, but also teaching accompanied by uh, signs, wonders, miracles, and also people being set free, people being delivered, and so on. Okay, so um, so let's uh, look at um, some aspect of that uh, ministry as well. Just a minute. Just a minute. Um, just a minute. personal encounter with the Lord. Our unit was I'm sorry, I uh, think this, just a minute, please. almost to America, then down the Atlantic, and then eastward around the Cape of Good Hope. And we called in at Durban in South Africa for a brief stop, and then up the east coast of Africa to Suez. And that's where we arrived, I think if I remember rightly, early in December 1940. I spent the next really the next two or three years in deserts, in Egypt, in Libya, and in the Sudan. And I learned, I think I understand why the Lord took Israel to the Promised Land through the desert. Because living in a desert is a very unique experience. Your priorities become very simple. Basically, you have four or five priorities. Number one is water. 
Number two is food. Number three is shelter. Number four is transportation. And your whole life is built around that. And uh, a lot of Eton and Cambridge was purged out of me in the desert. Not all of it, but some of it. And I became almost a friend with sand. I mean, you can't imagine how much sand plays a part in your life. It gets in your food, gets in your eyes. You have very little water to wash with. As a matter of fact, we often had more high-octane petrol than we had water. I don't know how it came about. Our um, division advanced from Egypt right through to near to Tripoli. Then Rommel came out with his unidentified tanks, and we retreated. And I took part in the longest retreat in the history of the British Army, which was 750 miles from Tripoli back to El Alamein. It's a very discouraging experience to be retreating continually for that length of time. Now, having become a believer, I thought I ought to pray about this. What will I pray? And I didn't know how to pray, but I felt the Lord gave me a prayer, which was, Lord, give us leaders such that it will be for your glory to give us victory through them. Because I was very disappointed in the leadership of the army that I saw. Having a background in, in the military life, I expected more from officers than I saw them coming out with. So I patiently prayed that prayer every day for a long while. I didn't know what was happening, but uh, Orkinbeck, who was in command in the Middle East, was replaced by another officer called Gott, who was up in the desert. Gott was flown back to take command in Cairo, but his plane crashed on landing. He was thrown out, broke his neck, and was killed. And so at that very critical stage, the British forces were left without a commander. And uh, Churchill, on his own initiative, then appointed a little-known commander named Montgomery. And uh, we knew nothing about him. Well, then <clears throat> the Battle of El Alamein was fought, and I was somewhere in the rear. The next day, I was listening to a news commentator in a little portable radio on the back, on the tailboard of the truck. And he was giving a description of the preparation of at, at Montgomery's headquarters the night before the battle. And he described how Montgomery came out, addressed his officers and men, and said, let us ask the Lord, mighty in battle, to give us the victory. And when he said that, I don't know if you can understand me, but heaven's electricity went through me from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And God said, that's the answer to your prayer. So I have always from that time on believed that God can intervene in history if we know how to pray. At that stage, I developed a skin infection on my feet, for which the doctors offered various names, each one longer than the previous one. And eventually, they just settled with chronic eczema. I, uh, my officers in my unit wanted to keep me with them, but eventually I had to be put in hospital. And I spent almost a year on end in military hospitals in the Middle East. In due course, I was transferred to a place called Al Bala on the Suez Canal. And there I was visited by a very unusual person, a lady Salvation Army brigadier who had a little ministry in Cairo. Her husband had died, and according to Salvation Army regulations, she took her husband's rank, which was a brigadier. She was well up in her 70s and was just about as militant about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues as other Salvationists are about salvation. So God bless her. She's with the Lord and has been for many years. She heard about this soldier sick in, on, at the Suez Canal. And she got hold of some vehicle. I don't know how she did it. She got an, an, a New Zealand soldier to drive her. And she brought with her an American young woman, her co-worker. And they drove, I think it was about 50 miles, 
to the hospital. Then, fully attired in her bonnet and ribbons and everything, she marched into the ward, overawed the, sis, the nurse, and got permission for me to go out and sit in the car with them and pray. She didn't ask me whether I wanted to do that. So I found myself sitting at the back of this very small four-seater car with the American young lady beside me and the Salvation Army Brigadier and the New Zealand driver in the front seat. We began to pray and this young woman beside me began to vibrate. And I mean, she was vibrating uh, very powerfully. And then I began to vibrate. And then everybody in the car began to vibrate. And then the car itself began to vibrate. And it was, it, the engine was not running and it was not. And I was aware that God was doing something. And then this young woman spoke in another tongue and then gave the interpretation. And I don't recall anything on the, of the interpretation except this one phrase. Consider the work of Calvary a perfect work, perfect in every respect and perfect in every aspect. Now I got out of the car just as sick as I was when I got in, but God had shown me the place to look for an answer, what he called the work of Calvary, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And over the years I've come to see that Jesus through that sacrifice provided forgiveness for sin, cleansing from sin, and healing for our physical bodies. And I've had my ups and downs at various times, but I have never, never forgotten that whole revelation that came to me. And I'm so overawed by God's mercy that he would take pity on one soldier in a remote hospital and send all that, and take all that trouble just to communicate that to me. We'll stop here. We'll we'll let's uh, take a break and then we'll come back and then we'll discuss. Right? Thank you.